Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Documentary filmmaking can be that much more challenging when you've got a subject who has made a career of knowing how to draw focus to himself and take the air out of the room, but it also opens up a door for special filmmakers to really make something unique and fantastic. But as always, if you are within the sound of my voice, you must be in the seats with once again, as always. My name is Dave Voigt. I am your host for this podcast, where we talk to a wide variety of industry professionals, not only about current projects, but what got them into the business, the art form in general, and, you know, why they were fans, because in this business, we all come to it as fans first. And on today's episode, we are going to talk a little bit about the new documentary, Watson, which is coming to theaters this Friday, November 7th, for a limited run as part of the Impact series before it heads to video on demand a couple weeks after. And we talked to director Leslie Chilcott, who is a veteran of the documentary form, and really how she got embedded with uh, Paul Watson, in case you... In case you weren't sure, it is Captain Paul Watson, the co-founder of Greenpeace, and C. Shepard, who has spent 40 years of his life fighting to end the destruction of ocean wildlife and, and its subsequent habitat. And while there's been other films made about Paul Watson before, I think where this one really stands out is that as much as we get uh, glimpses of his career and just sort of sort of the, uh, the the positive changes that he's made as a part of Greenpeace and a part of Sea Shepherd, we, we get a story about the man. It's not always perfect. He's He can be a little prickly. He's not a perfect human being, but he's a unique human being. And I think this is where where uh, Leslie's film really manages to stand out. And when we, when we talked to her, we, uh, we talked about Paul. We talked about the film. We talked to... Uh, documentary in general we uh, we talked about her favorite uh, documentaries even and yes we love man on a wire too leslie in case you're listening but uh that's about it and uh i'll let you get down to listening to this interview because it's a good one all right bye okay now obviously first off thank you so much for the time today i really appreciate it oh it's my pleasure thank you for watching the film can you walk me through sort of the initial I don't I don't know if it's an idea or if it's a conversation how you came with Paul to sort of to sort of get the ball rolling on a movie because I got to imagine I mean especially in documentary filmmaking sometimes you find the subject sometimes the subject finds you I'm always curious on how these things really kick off okay sure I don't I don't know how exciting it is but it's a true story um we were at a dinner party and my husband was asked who his hero was. And at first he said, you know, I don't have any heroes. And then finally he said, um, when asked again, he said, well, I think it would be Captain Paul Watson, you know, because he doesn't compromise and he's out there doing something, you know, every day. And then literally a few weeks later, I was going to an environmental event and we had to take a shuttle bus. And I was sitting in the back of the shuttle bus and we're all dressed in black. It's a very formal event. And this woman with bright blonde hair and a white dress got on the bus and she really stuck out, you know, cause everyone was wearing black. And I felt like I was in high school. She's walking towards the back of the bus where I'm sitting and I'm like, wait, she's coming towards me. She's coming towards me. And she sits down and she goes, hi, I'm Farrah Smith. I'm with Sea Shepherd. And I said, oh, hi, you know, I'm Leslie Chilcott. I'm with the, I'm a filmmaker. And so by the time we got to the event, I had asked her, you know, you guys film things all the time. And I know Paul can't come into the country right now. Why hasn't anyone done his life story? And, you know, why hasn't anyone made that movie? And in her sassy way, if you could picture the whole outfit, she goes, I don't know, why don't you make it? And I'm like, well, get me on Skype then with Paul. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, I was on the phone with him. He was petitioning, you know, to come back in the US. And so we started you know, getting to know each other over Skype. And then um, right when he came back to LA, I met with him. And then um, shortly thereafter, we started making the documentary. Well, and that kind of leads into my next question because I mean, Paul is a, as a subject is obviously very compelling and this very sort of dynamic figure, but he's also someone very sort of cognizant of the narrative. And I'm kind of curious, how do you as a filmmaker try to sort of 
balance the line between wanting to tell a story about the subject and making sure versus making sure the subject doesn't take up all the air in the room at the same time? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, you know, there's a danger when you're making a film about someone who you regard as a hero, because yeah. you don't want to just be like, oh, look how great and amazing he was and da, da, da. So I made the conscientious decision to just have Paul tear, tell his narrative. And then through the footage, we would see him in action and we would see news clips. So as opposed to having someone come on who says, hey, Paul's so amazing. He's been fighting for 50 years. He's this, he's stubborn, he's amazing. You know, he's funny, he's not funny. He's serious, he's risk taker, you know, all those things. Yeah. I thought through action, you know, the viewer could kind of judge for themselves. And I wanted to show, you know, I do think Paul is a hero, but I think, you know, he's also made some big sacrifices in his life to be totally. out there on the ocean. And he can be very, very, you know, critical. And I wanted to show, you know, all sides of him, including those sides. And my deal with him was, you know, you tell, you tell me everything and, um, you know, you don't have, you, you, you're not weighing in on cuts, you know, I'm gonna, I need you to trust me to, to present your story um, the way that I see it. And he um, was very trusting, you know, with someone that doesn't trust anyone and right. takes so many risks, he was, he was very trusting. So I think that, that you know, obviously I, I see what he does in a heroic light, but he's made some sacrifices and he's made some mistakes and I wanted to show those as well. I, I was struck when the film did mention that that they do shoot everything. And I'm kind of curious from a documentary filmmaker standpoint is having that sort of huge archive a blessing or a curse. I can imagine it can cut both ways. Yeah, it totally cuts both ways because even a year before um, I knew we were gonna be able to start filming I started, you know, begging Sea Shepherd to get their archives in shape. I would send them resumes of archivists, you know, that like right. <laughs> that I got from the film academy, you know, from the academy and other places. And they said, "Don't worry, we're, you know, we're getting it in shape and we're getting it in shape." But because, you know, they're very dependent on funding, a lot of times their offices, they move their offices all the time. Oh, we have a good deal here. Oh, now we're in Washington. Now we're in Los Angeles. So these archives have kind of been shipped all over the place and then their servers are based, you know, with Sea Shepherd Global out of the global offices in Amsterdam. So they started uploading footage that they hadn't uploaded and their interns started tagging the film. And then when we came along, um, we went to a post facility that I had worked at a lot called Local Hero in Santa Monica. And we begged them every evening for months, they would, up, they would upload 166 terabytes of footage that Sea wow. Shepherd servers were too slow to upload. So that took like six, I can't remember, like six or eight weeks. Then they gave us a key to their storage unit, which was packed with literally over 100 bankers boxes of footage and film and all of that. So we tried to get that organized. And that was like a shot in the dark because I'm probably getting in the weeds here, but it might be an old, you know, three quarter inch tape and right. maybe they digitized it. Maybe they haven't, we don't know. So we have to find this deck that nobody uses anymore. You know, and we find a guy who spends months transferring footage for us and like original audio recordings. And a lot of times it was great because we got better footage for our use or their use. And then between their interns tagging and our staff tagging footage, you know, throughout the film, like six months into the project, we could find stuff we couldn't find six months earlier because it hadn't been, you know, tagged. It wasn't searchable. So it was a lot and a lot of footage. Um, surprisingly, there were a lot of incidents that happened that they weren't filming because, you know, people might be in danger or they were running for safety. And a lot of times, you know, all those all those guys are really, and men and women are super brave and they keep filming, but other times, you know, there, is, there isn't footage or the footage was damaged because it's so old. Yeah. When you're hip deep in so much archival footage, how does the narrative change sort of along the way? Because I can imagine you'll go in with an idea of a story you want to tell, but things could change depending on how the footage keeps unfurling, as I suppose is the right word. Yeah, we, you know, um, it's obviously easier, easier when you find great footage to tell that story. Um, so what my strategy for that was, um, 
because I had so many questions for Paul, we couldn't do the interview in one day. So we spread it out. You know, we did a series of interviews and then six months later, we went back and did another series of interviews. So I had that time in between to either look for footage or um, see if there was enough material uh, visuals to match the stories, you know, that he was he was telling. And then, you know, I went to Costa Rica and I could film what was going on there to match with the stories that he told. And, you know, we found the fisherman from that boat in Costa Rica and he was willing to do an interview. So it was, we were always in research mode. On the other hand, you know, some of that early Greenpeace footage is so beautiful. And, you know, part of that story had been told before, but I hadn't seen like, the magical moments where you could see encountering a whale that had been killed, you could see it changing people's minds, you know, and I really wanted to show, you know, it was such an innocent time and they were out there doing such gutsy stuff and it it really changed them and it changed a whole generation of people. And so I wanted to, to capture that and transfer that footage and, and, you know, color it in a way that I felt reflected the times more than how you would color it now, you know? So um, it it was really quite an effort for our editors and our research staff. It was kind of a Herculean effort for sure. Oh, I don't doubt it. I mean, because it's uh, like you say, there are some really, really stunning moments in the film, which, which kind of segues into something I've always wanted to ask because like the doc, the form of documentary film gets a lot of misconceptions sometimes but at the same time there it's always kind of evolving and pushing boundaries because on one end yeah. you may be in an editing bay for weeks on end on the other day you may get a phone call and have to book an airplane ticket to go fly somewhere with your camera to do an interview that's kind of sort of the nature of the beast and i'm kind of curious from your perspective as a filmmaker like what is it about the form of documentary that really sort of draws you into it and makes you want to tell stories in this way? I think once you've had the opportunity, because I've worked in all different mediums, but once you've had the opportunity to try and really capture someone's story, you know, and it's not scripted, it's, yeah. it's easier when it's scripted and you're like, okay, wardrobe goes here, you know, in, in terms of art department, I want this, light it this way, do this, all these things. And, 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 and that's absolutely an amazing world to live in. But when you have someone like Paul, like, you know, you've heard this phrase before, but you literally can't write this stuff. No, of course, I yeah. mean, His reality is better than any fiction. So to have the privilege of telling like the harrowing moments and the exciting moments and the tough moments and the wins and the losses, like I, for me, that is telling, as simple as it sounds, being able to accurately tell someone's truth, I think is a, is a, is a real privilege, privilege, excuse me. And I think if and when you get it right, it's a real privilege you know, for the audience as well. But I also think the documentary form is changing. And when you're talking about something that you don't have footage for, you know, I think when you shoot impressionistic moments or for example, you know, Paul writes poetry and you would, you would never guess that, right? He's, he's a loud cantankerous pirate. Why would he write poetry? And so, you know, as an experiment, um, I had him but read not his own poetry, but some of the poems that are at the beginning of Moby Dick. There's like song lyrics and poems. And, and I didn't want to go into Moby Dick and we didn't have the time. So he read a couple of those phrases. And then when we were coming back from Cocos Island in Costa Rica, we, we were, went through this horrific storm and we filmed it. And, you know, I was like, wait, oh, this will go with the with the poem, you know, and we edited it as an experiment. And I think, you know, there's so much information in Watson that you need these little breaks with the whales or the sharks or the storm. And then, and then you can understand Paul's philosophy more. So I think documentaries are also getting, you know, much more um, creative with uh, the tools that you have at your disposal and, and what you're, you're able to do. I mean, there's the follow doc, the verite doc, which absolutely has its place. And, and is, you know, you have to pick the right format for the story. He had an outlandish life. So I needed to bring more, more, uh, you know, outlandish ways of showing it and, and, and more um, tools from cinematography to just show this larger than life character. Sorry for the long winded answer. No, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. So, (laughs) but I mean, and that also, because a film like this, 
really does hinge on you getting the trust of the subject. And I mean, how does that process kind of unfold? I mean, I can imagine from person to person, it's very different, but I mean, it's a very unique thing to sort of be able to sort of engender trust when someone's going, hey, I want to tell your life story and I'm going yeah. to discuss this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and lots of people have approached him, you know, with that idea. But I think, you know, Paul's very savvy, you know, he, t he tells that part in the film where I mean, how lucky was he to have Marshall McLuhan as a guest lecturer, you know, I mean, like, the more I get to even now, after knowing him for years, like, he's like, Oh, did I ever tell you about the time when such and such happened? And I'm like, No, you know, how? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is from someone who does like 15 major, you know, activities every year. So there's, there's so many stories, but I think with Paul, because he's media savvy and he understands with she, Sea Shepherd, you know, he, he had his, his thing that he says, you know, sex, if you have sex scandal, celebrity or violence, it will make the papers. Right. And so yeah. on the one hand, he has all these great talking points. On the other hand, they're talking points. And so I would interview him and I would hear a talking point at first. And then I would try another way. And then I would hear a version of that talking point. And I would say, Paul, I need, you know, come on, this is this talking point that you say. And he goes, it's a what? And I'm like, you know, the modern term for this is a talking point. I'm like, I don't, I don't want, want that. Tell me, tell me, uh, you know, tell me why you came up with that talking point. And so it was days and days of, of, of grilling. And after a while, you know, he was just, he was really, really um, open and, and, and forthcoming. And so um, it, it was a great experience in that respect. I don't respect, I don't know if I answered your question. No, but you did though, because it, 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 you, this film really does kind of manage to walk the line between the talking point and sort of giving us the entertainment value and giving us a chance to know the person as opposed to the Sea Shepherd talking points that he wants to get across. There really is... And I mean, it's a delicate line that you got to walk because not all, I mean, granted, not all film documentaries have done this in the past in terms of trying to highlight a subject. So sometimes it will focus on the issue. Sometimes okay. it will focus too much on the person. This really does kind of try to go right down the middle of that line. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Um, Paul Staff would tell me that, you know, he, he doesn't worry. And I'm like, what do you mean he doesn't worry? And they're like, no, seriously, he, he doesn't worry. And, and I would ask him and I said, so, you know, the, the usual like warm up question, what do you worry about at night? What keeps you up at night? And he's like, oh, I've never had any trouble sleeping. And I say, okay, but you know, what's the thing that, that really concerns you and worries you? And he goes, I don't worry. It's a useless emotion. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not possible. And he goes, no, really. He said, I do the things that I can do that day. I have no trouble going to sleep. And then I get up the next day and I continue, you know, doing those things. And I thought, oh my gosh, what if, can you imagine if you lived your life that way, where you really did everything you could that day, and then you could just go to sleep and, and, and give up the next day. And also I'm like, oh, you know, what do you feel like? Are you sentimental about this? And he goes, what, what do you, what do you mean by sentimental? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, are, are you familiar with the word? And he goes, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't, I'm not sentimental. So I'm not sure what you mean. And then I would say, Paul, I've been to your house. You saved the doorknob, you know, from this angry sealer who tried to almost kill you in Canada. You have the keys to the room. You have seashells when you were, you know, stranded on this island. I mean, these are like trinkets of sentimentality. He's like, no, I, I, I just thought they're funny. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he's sentimental because he saved them, you know, but it's just not a concept that exists within his brain. So he's a pretty fascinating topic. Now, I mean, I forget, I forget the exact quote, but I mean, I remember seeing a line somewhere that whenever you're talking to someone or having a conversation, it takes sort of X amount of minutes to get them to loosen up, to really get sort of a hint of who they really are. During this entire process with Paul, was there a moment where it just sort of like the bell went off in your head? It's like, okay, I know who this guy is. I know what the movie's gonna be. There was a moment when, before I had gotten funding for the film, I, I filmed one interview, you know, with some, with, with the help of some friend, Paul. And 
he, you know, because we put together a sizzle reel because that's what you what you often do. Right. And he was answering questions and I was getting the talking points at first. And I'm like, you know, say that another way. And he's like, but that's the way it is. That, that's the truth. That's how it is. And I'm like, well, you know, try and say it in a way that you haven't said it before. You know, and I was trying all of these things. And then when he started talking about fishermen, there was this little flash in his eye where he was in the middle of a talking point, you know, and then, and then he kind of said, this is the way it is. And his eyes just flash. And I was like, that's the real Paul. And I'm like, that's the Paul that I have to get. Not, not that the, you know, for the most part, what you see is what you get with him, but that's the deeper thinker there, you know, and the one that doesn't just act that really puts not only thought and care and concern, but strategy. And I saw that little flash in his eyes. And that was, you know, a good six months before we started filming. And I remembered, you know, that moment. And so I was always trying to get back to that moment. Also, you know, with someone like Paul Watson, who's very media savvy, and and we did this same thing with Al Gore and Inconvenient Truth. A lot of times you shut off the camera. (coughs) Some of the interviews you hear in the film are audio only interviews. And that is a you know, much more comfortable situation for the person, you know, eventually they forget the cameras there, but you know, there's still kind of an awareness sometimes and the audio only interviews um, or the interviews where we would just show up and he was looking up tuna prices on his computer. Those I think are, are some more of the golden moments because those are just real feelings and just talking. That's awesome. Now, I mean, I guess my next question is, because especially in this business, people always come to it as fans first. And I'm kind of curious from your perspective, is there a film or was there sort of a moment when you were younger where sort of like, the, like I said, the light bulb went on and you sort of ultimately decided that this is what I want to do with my life. This is the, I want to be able to tell stories and I want to tell them in this kind of format. Ooh, that's a good question. I, okay. Did, did you <laughs> <laughs> this is going to date me, but there was a movie and, you know, perhaps it will help that I was really young when I saw it, but do you remember the movie Capricorn one? Of course. Okay. So when Capricorn one is obviously the this, this story about these astronauts that go to the moon and it turns out that the government, you know, is completely faking the moon landing. And I remember when that happened for some reason, instead of thinking, Oh, this is a really clever, interesting story. I thought, I didn't know you could, you know, because at that point it was like ET and, you know, all of these other things. And, and I was like, wow, the story behind the story. I was like, that is so interesting to me. I wonder, you know, I wonder if I could do anything in that area, you know, and I've been avoiding going back and watching that movie now. It It doesn't age well. (laughs) I figured it, I mean, it was, I mean, you know, it was, parts of it were a little cheesy then, you know, I can't imagine like watching it now, but the fact that there was this whole story behind this story and the stuff that had been faked and people that, you know, people had been lied to, it really laid the groundwork for what I ended up doing later. But, you know, as a little kid, I was like, what, you know? And then when the guy wakes up in the desert with the scorpion on his face, I'm like, oh my God, he's not on the moon. He's in the desert, you know? And that really, I know I sound ridiculous, but that had a really big effect on me. And I thought I need to, you know, maybe this is a, a, maybe this could be a job. It still took many years for me to figure that out, but that was the, the first moment. Although I think referencing Capricorn One is probably the best answer I've ever had to that. <laughs> I, in, in my entire time doing this, I love that answer. <laughs> You know, you want it to be something really heady, you know, like some critically acclaimed movie. But for me, really, it was Capricorn One. I love the honesty. That's why you're a documentarian. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, I guess just to start putting a bow on all this, when you're looking at projects, when you're coming, like when you're thinking like, okay, this is done, because I know as a documentarian, you've always got to have a couple of things on the go because these things take years upon years to finish. Sure. What is it about, I guess, the story that you look for? Is it the subject? Is it the issue? Is it all of the above? Like, is there like, or is there some sort of little secret hidden sort of angle that you like to sort of focus in on when something sort of catches your eye? 
Hmm. That is a good question. Um, I definitely like the idea of a whole bunch of people coming together to tackle something difficult. So I notice like that ends up being a theme, whether, you know, I'm making a documentary about girls coding or, um, you know, uh, Paul Watson, but I think you have to choose your medium for the story. Like for, for Watson, it was definitely, you know, the man yeah. and all that, that he had done. And then everything else came after that. But right now I'm, you know, for example, trying to, um, just literally finish, uh, writing the pitch last night. I'm doing, I'm trying to do something we'll see on wolves. And in this particular case, um, the wolves end up being kind of a portal for all sorts of issues. Like how you feel about a wolf is almost how you feel about, you know, politics in general, or what side. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, it's either a magical creature that does all these things and restores the ecosystem or it's a killer of animals and it's evil. And, and from medieval times to now, it represents the dark side and, you know, Little Red Riding Hood. And so like for this particular story, um, it, it, it's actually like a, a totem animal that opens up this other larger story. So it really, I don't have, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I don't have one, one way of, of doing it. Um, in general, I do tend to make, make issue related films, but you know, I just did a six part series, you know, uh, for epics on Charles Manson called Helter Skelter, you know, and, and, and for that, I was trying to show the underlying um, cultural things that were going on in the late 60s. And that was a totally different thing. I mean, but I mean, you know, there's something, and I mean, just to dial it back to Watson, because like he is such a compelling character, but again, it's, we're getting the story warts and all. We're getting stories upon stories upon stories. It's not just about Sea Shepherd. It's not just about the Greenpeace. It's about him as well. And we're getting sort of a mesh of that. I mean, I really think, at least from my perspective as a fan, when when you're watching a documentary, you want to try to get all those stories because at the end of the day, people want to know about people and people have layers, much like much like Paul off very obviously does. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And also, you know, when we when we started making the film, there was no intention for us to film with humpback whales. Um, and this sort of addresses one of your your earlier questions. There's there's been so many amazing underwater cinematographers that have all this incredible footage of humpback whales. But when Paul tells the story, and I, and I don't think this will be giving anything away, but he compares um he, he talks about whales having a certain intelligence you know and yeah. we're like searching throughout the universe for this alien intelligence and yet we have these intelligences in animals right here in the u.s that that we haven't explored so when he tells a story about how um the spaceship earth story yeah i won't, I won't tell it here to to spoil it but he was talking about how some of these whales are, are like spaceships going through the water. And I was like, okay, we have to film underneath humpback whales. And I could find very little footage. So the underwater cinematographer that I had filmed sharks with in Costa Rica, he and I went to the kingdom of Tonga and tried to, you know, it's not legal to scuba dive with whales there. So you free dive under, you know, under the whales. And I'm like, okay, we have to try and get underneath them, you know, and hold the shot for a really long time. So we picked a higher frame rate. We shot at 80 frames per second. And Christian, you know, first couple of days were a bust, you know, and, right. and we knew we could not get this because there was not a lot of footage like this. And then, um, on our, at the end of our second day, we had some cooperative whales. And then we found this mom and calf on our third day that let us film them day after day. And he got underneath a humpback whale and it comes soaring across. And it's like a two minute shot in the movie of this humpback whale coming by. And it perfectly illustrates his story. So the, the best laid plans, you know, once you, you dial into Paul's truth and what's really affected him, I needed to film with humpback whales so I could understand what he was talking about. So I could provide that experience for the viewer because not everybody's gonna be able to go scuba diving or free diving and swim with all of these wonderful creatures. So it was my job as a filmmaker to find that visually 
so that I could visually translate the things that Paul was saying. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely does. And I mean, I really think that almost kind of not only encapsulates Paul's story, but just sort of the art of documentary filmmaking as well, because it's not like you say, there isn't necessarily a wardrobe section or a set or this kind of thing. There are days where you have to improvise and try to get a shot from underneath the humpback whale. Yeah, yeah, and you're always editing in your head. You're like, okay, wait, I have this from archive. He said this thing three months ago. When I was at his house, I saw this thing, and now I have this whale doing this. Will this work? You know, it's like you're just constantly, this wheel is going in your head so that you can, you're, you're, you're listening to what he's saying, and then you're trying to use all the tools you can to best illustrate visually what yeah. he's saying. And then other times, you know, I wanted to have a more critical eye and, you know, for, for as amazing as it is, most of what he does, sometimes he'll say something that's absolutely correct, but it doesn't help his cause, you know? Yeah. And so I wanted, I wanted to show those things um, as well. Now, just final question. You're on a desert island. You can only watch one documentary. What is it? Hmm. Let's see, because it wouldn't necessarily be my favorite. It would be one that I could watch over yeah, and over, over yeah. again. Oh dear. I'm just gonna take a second. Yeah, no problem. Um very, you know, oh gosh, I've got like five in my head. How do I pick Get them just shoot them all off? How do I pick which one? Um, let me think here for a minute. No problem. Because, you know, don't you usually get 10 de Desert Island discs? That's true. That, if you buy me, I'll let you have five. If you want to have the five. Um, let me think about this. What keeps coming to mind is uh, Salesman, which oh, okay. is, you know, the very, very early. But, but just because... Uh, I would say, okay, five. Um, salesman, um, I am not your Negro. Oh, excellent, yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of music ones. Let me see if I can limit it to one music one. Um, hoop see, Dreams. You, oh, there you go, yeah, Hoop Dreams. With music, I'd probably go Woodstock just because it's so fly on the wall. I think that's my, per that's my music doc. Yeah, I just, I, um, I just watched that like six months ago. Um, but there's also, um, oh, Great Gardens keeps coming to mind, but that's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that on there. Uh, oh dear, why am I struggling to narrow it down? Well, it, just, uh, it speaks to the breadth of quality documentary film out there. Um, oh, I, here's something that really changed my documentary view. Why am I not thinking of the name of it? It's um, it's uh, fast, cheap, and out of control. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, because I was like, I didn't know a, a documentary, you know, could could be like that. Um, let me think of which music one I would do. I'm thinking. Sorry. No problem. I'm thinking very slowly. Oh, well, let me think. Um, oh gosh, there's so many good music docs. Recent one, old one? Older. Okay. Um, why can I not think of it? But to be fair, most of the like most of the music docs I've been thinking of in my head right now are all pretty recent. I'm trying to think of older stuff too. Well, the the, the one that I'm trying to think of is is very much like Gimme Shelter, um, but I can't think of what it is for some reason um you mean exile on main street or cocksucker blues one of those um oh my goodness is it the last waltz no oh dear um i can't think of it i've stumped you i love it <laughs> i'm so sorry i can't think of it you have totally stumped me um and if things like whiplash are getting in the way that aren't even documentaries and it's just like it's it's um Ooh, decline of western civilization was pretty great um i'm thinking it's gonna come to me maybe i should just email you afterwards when i if you want to you're very welcome 
Maybe we'll just have to go with four or or pick three. It works. No, yeah. but I mean, I, I, as you, honestly, th this really, this whole, I think this whole conversation kind of speaks to just the breadth of really the like, quality of documentary filmmaking that's out there and how many different ways and forms it can show up in. And I think Watson is a, is a great example of that. And I just want to put a bow on this and say thank you for the time today. Thank you so much. You know, three hours from now, I'm going to like be in the middle of something and out loud, I'm going to go the wrecking crew or whatever the, the, the documentary is that I'm not thinking of. <laughs> so you've, now, you've now affected my whole day. Thank you. <laughs> well, oh, well, that makes me very happy, but thank you again for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye.